Um, so I had a problem, which was uh, my business was configuration management, which is awesome. Uh, and I was good at selling configuration management to people. But then a couple of years ago, everybody stopped talking about configuration management, and they all wanted to talk about DevOps and continuous delivery, and that was confusing. Um, and uh, I found myself giving bad advice, because I, I, just, I just replied with the configuration management advice, which seemed like a good idea at the time. And then it didn't work. And then they would come back like in six months and be like, we don't like you as much as we thought we would. And that wasn't good for business. <laughs> so, uh, so I started looking into why they wanted to know about those things. And when I looked into it deeply enough, what I discovered was, uh, was one, I wasn't going to get there by staring at the words continuous delivery or the words DevOps. I wasn't going to understand what my customers were wanting by talking about the words that they were using to describe what they wanted. And what I found was that DevOps was this response and a justification for this shift in the fund foundational meaning of IT. We had this thing, we called it IT. That thing is no longer what we said it was, <clears throat> and we came up with another word to describe it. And then continuous delivery in a very similar way is this response and justification for this shift in customer expectations about the pace with which we innovate and consume those very same things. So um, IT moving from the back to the front, um, you know, the shift in DevOps is essentially that we went from a place where if you did IT, your job was to run back office systems, but you never really dealt with customers, and customers didn't really consume your stuff. Who all has a smartphone? I don't have one in my pocket because I'm speaking, right, most of the room. Um, I think the rest of you just didn't want to raise your hand. And, <clears throat> and, and what, what that tells you is all the technology that makes that thing work, your email, all that stuff, that was all back office technology even 15 years ago, right? It didn't really matter but now it's sort of embedded in your daily life. And so every technology that used to only work internally now actually has this very direct forward-facing customer impact in a way that it did not before. Um, and, and that problem uh, has caused this cultural and professional movement that we call DevOps to grow up. There was this collective experience of people that, that also happens to map to people who built the web in the first place where the challenges they encountered were very similar and that they brought a lot of what felt like back office compute technologies. And now that was the thing you were doing when you, when you used the internet. Um, and so the transition here is ubiquitous. Um, what's happening in the global market, the macro level, uh, isn't going to stop. It's actually going to continue. And when it's done, there won't be any more of what looks like traditional IT. Um, and it's simply because the, the way we use it and the way we relate to that technology has completely changed. Um, and, and if you want to be good uh, in the next generation of this, then you too will get good at that. And you don't really have a choice. It's not an optional thing. You can do it well or you can do it badly, but you will be doing it. Um, so then applications, um, this is the other side of it. So this was a thing where uh, Sam Walton on the left there, Walmart. <clears throat> so I, I had a chance to go to Bentonville and there's a Walmart museum and it's awesome and if you get a chance you should go. But one of the things that I heard and read while I was there was the story about uh, a dude who went into Walmart. Sam Walton built this magic, magical juggernaut that is Walmart uh, based on, in the beginning, just amazing customer service. And the thing he did that no one else did was he gave his employees a share of Walmart, and so they had ownership in Walmart. And there was the story of this dude who went in and he bought a gun, and then he went hunting with the gun, and he shot the gun at some stuff, and he missed, and he was mad. And so he came back to the Walmart with the gun, and he was like, boom, gun doesn't suit straight. I want a different gun. Like, I feel robbed. And like, you know when a gun's been shot, you can't resell it. Like, it's not a thing. But the person behind the counter was like, <clears throat> OK, I've, you know what? I had the same problem with that gun. That's a stupid gun. Let's get you a new gun. And like, they got him a gun, and he took the gun back, and he went. And you know that dude told every single person the only place you should ever buy a gun is Walmart, right? And it wasn't because it wasn't like the gun shop down the street. It's because they did that for that human being. Jeff Bezos knew the same thing when he built Amazon, right? Soft software, as a way that we now want to consume everything, is now the way that we provide good customer service, right? There's no human being anymore to, to intermediate your bad experience with a gun. Um, your job now is to actually do the software and infrastructure changes that will fix that bad experience. And the faster you can do that, the better off you will be. And that is why we have continuous delivery. We call that a thing. It's the discipline that grew out of the reality that we had to get those things, infrastructure, applications, in front of our customers more often, all the time. And failure to do that has really big impacts on customer satisfaction and loyalty, right? If you don't do it, then you'll get eaten just like Amazon ate Walmart. Well, a little, <laughs> but you get my point, right? Um, okay, so uh, then uh, once I understood what was going on, then I started to look at all of my friends who were doing good work in that space and try to figure out what was common about them. And this is my list of things that seemed to be common about those people. So one, they all had strong cultures of personal empowerment and accountability. This was the number one thing that they all had, and everybody who failed to do these two things failed at this organizationally and culturally. Um, uh, 
you know, the headline here is if you have a strong reliance on centralized decision making, if you have very few individuals who are responsible for outcomes, if you have very few capable full stack engineers, if you have a lot of architects who do design but no implementation, you're probably failing at this. Um, and you should watch Ben's talk to learn how to be better at it. Um, treating failure as a learning opportunity, not as a dangerous thing to be avoided. This is the very close second thing. Everybody who was good at this had this relationship to failure. Um, I'm not going to read the Decker quote because it's a 10-minute talk. But um, you know, failure to understand that when you fail, you can do two things. You can either blame human beings or you can learn from your mistakes. Um, and all of those organizations had very deeply adopted the idea that it was their job to learn from their mistakes, not to blame the humans. They all had service-oriented architectures of one kind or another. This slide always gets me in trouble. There's someone in this room who's going to come up to me after this talk and be like, but I don't. And, I'm in, uh, and my point is, yeah, except that they totally do. They just call it dark launching. And like, in the end, they've separated things out so they're reasonably easy to partition. So some people are all microservice -y, Some people are doing like if statements. I don't really care. But the point is, you have a thing <laughs> that, feels roughly, that feels roughly fucking service-oriented, right? Just back off. Um, they're, um, they're culturally allergic to things that make you slow. So I did some, I, I had the honor of working with some of the dudes at Facebook to rebuild their infrastructure. And uh, if you're a configuration management person at all, they had the craziest constraint of all time, which was anyone, anywhere, at any time could change anything they wanted about any Facebook server whenever they felt like it, and that was the goal. That's a crazy configuration management goal. Um, and, but it was their goal, and they did it, and they achieved it. And the number one thing they couldn't do is get in each other's way. Anything that happened in that organization that involved you saying someone else couldn't try a thing got you murdered and just like run out on a rail. It's like a really nice rail out in like, anyway, but you're still gone. <laughs> um, and so being allergic to things that are slow is very consistent. So then um, they're all addicted to data. They care a lot, and they track data about their internal performance and their users' perceptions. And they use those things to evaluate whether or not what they're doing is good or bad. They don't use their emotional commitment to the software they've made. They instead use their perceptions and how they can measure about what the impact of those things were uh, to make decisions. So that's how they are. How do you become them? How many people in this room feel like you do all those things? I don't. I run a company. Um, so what did, how, do we, how have we seen people successfully transition to get, having more of those things? One, understand the full scope of what you do. So you have to successfully navigate the transition between where you are and where you want to be. And that gap is fundamentally huge, and it covers the entirety of your business. It's not just software development. It's actually business requirements. It's accounting. It's, um, it's compliance. It's all of those things. And how much or how little it will change depends on your organization. But every piece of it will change, and it's completely interconnected. So next, you can't confuse your existing structure for hard business requirements. This happens all the time. Um, you know, you have three teams, and they all have a silo. And so they build a solution for their piece of the silo. And then the big plan is that we'll come together and integrate. And then you're like, hmm, that plan sounds suspicious. Um, <laughs> so like, um, it's, it's basically like the enterprise version of the underpants gnome from South Park. <laughs> so don't do that. Just because that's the way you're structured doesn't mean that's the way you should build your organization. You're structured that way because that's the way you built your organization last time, which by definition, you're having this conversation because something is different. Therefore, <laughs> it's not going to be the same. Um, can find the blast radius, but not the magnitude of the explosion. This is hard advice, but the truth is, it's so fundamentally different from what you're doing today that your only thing you can do is learn how to do it by doing it. So if you, if you only blow up a part of it and then pretend you figured it out, you're probably wrong. Instead, you need to find a safe way to blow it all the way up. Talk differently to your business owners. Have a slice, have a silo of what you do where you go vertically very, very deep. So like blow it all the way up um, in a very small space so that you can then talk about what that was like and improve it so that you can then broaden it out to everybody. Um, this is the exact opposite advice I used to be giving, because in automation, you want to be like small wins equals lots of money. Um, <clears throat> but it's wrong if what you're doing is fundamental change. Um, you have to think about your systems as a whole view, not just one piece. So like I said earlier, it's not just your organizational structure, it's your technology as well. They're all deeply interconnected. Uh, and if you don't think about them as a holistic experience, um, things will go wrong. Finally, you have to reinforce your culture with technology and vice versa. Tooling is the institutionalization of your culture. So right now, the tools you use and the way you work is an institutionalization of the culture you have to solve your problem the way you solve it. So if you want to be different, one, it's not enough simply to come to FlowCon and believe. You actually have to change the way you work, and doing that requires changing the systems by which you operate. You cannot expect people's behaviors to change if they go to work every day and have to use the system that reinforces the bad behavior. Um, and so when people tell you that it's just culture, they're lying to you. I did this too. I was wrong. It's not just culture. It's also your tools, and you must change them. I don't know that I care what you change them to, but just don't believe that you can leave them in place uh, and have your magic cultural revolution succeed. Uh, 
My last list here is some bad advice. If I gave it to you, I want to apologize. One was tools don't matter, culture does. I said this for a long time. This was great advice when I was fighting with the puppet dudes about whether I was a good person, to be honest, because um, <laughs> it like ended the conversation. I'm like, you can, we can all be friends. Um, but it's not actually good advice for changing. Um, small and wide, this is good advice for incremental improvement. If you're doing Kaizen, small and wide is not a bad plan. If you're blowing up the universe to make yourself fundamentally 1,000% better, it's terrible advice, and you shouldn't take it. Um, the last one is that your executives will, will come along if you just show them a little bit. That's actually not true. So either they understand that they're in sort of an apocalyptic event and they need to change or their business will slowly fail, or you're better off letting them continue to believe that everything's going to be okay with 20% improvement and not fighting a fight you can't win. Because the macro level trend is so strong that if you just wait, they'll come around. <laughs> like, like, you don't have to fight, you just have to wait. And if you get... <laughs> And if, and if you get tired of waiting, you can quit and go to someone else who's ready. So it's cool because it's ubiquitous. Uh, and that's my vendor talk. Thanks.